death, darkness, silence, and blood. Jesus's good, pure blood. There had to be blood. There must be blood. And everybody around Jerusalem, everybody in Jerusalem that night, they knew there must be blood. Because you see, this wasn't the first time the story of Jesus was told. This wasn't the first time the story of Jesus was seen. God himself had set it up so that the story of Jesus was told every single year in grand fashion for a thousand years before his son ever stepped onto the scene. The story goes all the way back to the book of Exodus, chapters 11, 12, 13, and it's called the Passover. You see, God's people, they find themselves in slavery in this land of Egypt. Egypt's ruler, Pharaoh, was a ruthless, self-worshipping God of a man. But the true God, he raises up his servant Moses, a reluctant leader who goes to confront Pharaoh. But every time Moses confronts Pharaoh, things only get worse. God's people who were slaves have to do more work, but they're given fewer resources to do that work. They suffer more beatings, more curses, more pain. But they call out to God, and so God wages war against Pharaoh. He starts a war that only he can finish, a war that you and I probably know as the plagues. It is God systematically picking apart all of Pharaoh's defenses. Pharaoh's river gods of the Nile, God destroys with the blood in the river. Pharaoh's field gods of the harvest, God destroys with the locusts. The sky gods, the sun gods, God destroys with darkness. And on it goes for nine brutal plagues. But with every single plague, Pharaoh only grows harder. He hates God more. He hates God's people only more. Life only gets more difficult for the people of God. And so eventually we come to the tenth and final plague, the death of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. The most deadly plague, the most costly plague, the most violent plague plague. And it starts with God first going and threatening Pharaoh with this death of all the firstborn. This plague is predicted. This punishment is promised. And God makes it very clear to Pharaoh that this is all about God getting a people for himself. As much as Pharaoh might want to, as much as Pharaoh might try, he can't have God's people. God will have them for himself. And God says that he's going to show his sovereign power over everything, his might, his control over against the attempted might and attempted control of Pharaoh. God says he's going to show his sovereignty all the way down to the dogs roaming the alleys in the night. Moses reports it to Pharaoh like this in Exodus 11, verses 4 through 7. Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt. And every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. 
And then after God has threatened Pharaoh, he goes and he prepares his people for this Passover. His appointed way to spare his people from the outpouring of his wrath. He tells them to prepare a meal. He tells them how to do it. He says, go get a little lamb, spotless, without blemish, about a year old, and get that four days before you have to kill it. Four days, long enough for every little boy and every little girl to fall in love with that little lamb. Long enough for that lamb to feel like it's part of the family. It goes like this in chapter 12. Verse 3, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. At twilight on that fateful day, the lambs are slain. There is no Passover if there is no lamb who is slain. And then God instructs them, take the blood of this lamb and put it on your doorpost and the lintel over your door. Cover your door with the blood. And then he tells them to eat bitter herbs that night so that they would look back and remember the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. He tells them to eat unleavened bread, dressed, ready to go in haste to remember that they had to flee as quickly as possible. And he tells them to eat it all, every last bit, every last bite, every last crumb, because they will need the strength for the journey ahead. And then he tells them what the blood is all about. In verse 13, he says this, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood is the distinguishing mark for the Israelites. Not their hardship or their slavery or their suffering. Not their family lineage. Not their sin. Not their idolatry. It is the blood of the Lamb that sets them apart. And when God sees the blood, He will pass over them. No plague will befall them. And then God finally tells them how to remember this epic night for generations and generations to come. He says every single year, he gives a script to parents to tell this story in grand fashion to their children. There's a reason they got the lamb four days before they killed it, so that they would remember it. And then finally, after the people of God hear all these instructions, they simply bow their heads and worship. They obey without question. They don't bicker or complain like they had before. They don't rail against God's servant Moses like they had before. They simply bow their heads and worship God. They obey. And then... On that night, it actually all happens. God had threatened Pharaoh. There was no more time to wait. God had prepared his people, and there was no more time to wait. Everyone had been warned, some to hardening and some to softening. Everybody knew what was coming. Some ignored the threat, and some prepared in faith. And make no mistake, death was coming to every single house. Death was coming to every single family all throughout the land of Egypt. And the reason death was coming to every single family all throughout Egypt is that every single family deserved death that night. The Egyptians deserved death. They hated God. They hated God's people. And the Israelites too, they deserved death. They were sinners idolaters, grumblers, complainers. They too deserve death. So death was coming to every single house that night. It was just a matter of who and how. God passed by every single house 
one by one by one. And there was only one distinction between the house where the firstborn was slain and the house where he wasn't. And that was the blood of the lamb. House to house to house. No blood on the door. The firstborn is slain. Morning comes up, welling rises up, a cry goes out, house to house to house. There's blood on the door, that's a sign. Death has already come to this house. Blood has already been spilled here. God passes over, house to house to house The cries call out, the welling rises up, the mourning multiplies all throughout the land of Egypt. Now, you tell me what you would do if you're that dad or that mom and you're huddled in the back of your little pathetic slave quarters and you know that he's coming house to house to house. You he- tell me what you do when all around you hear the shrieking cries of mothers and fathers who are losing their firstborn. You tell me where are you going to put all your faith? Where are you going to put all your trust? Where are you going to put all your hope, all your chance of making it out alive? I'll tell you where you put it. You put it in the blood of the Lamb. You put your hope, your faith, your only lasting chance in the blood of the Lamb, not in your ability to shield your son, not in your ability to block out the cries, not in your ability to hide. You're huddled in the back of your one-room shanty and you're saying, Oh God, give me what I don't deserve. I've got my idols packed away in my bags that I'm going to take here in a minute. I deserve death. I have sinned against you. I've railed against your servant Moses. Don't give me what I deserve, oh God. See the blood. See the blood. Please see the blood. And then God passes over. Your son is spared. He's near to you, pressed against your chest, and you're holding him. God saw the blood. He spared your son. And then it dawns on you that you too are a firstborn. And you too are still breathing. God saw the blood, he spared your life. Now, listen listen very carefully to this. You need to know this. God did not make peace with their sin. He didn't make peace with the sin of the Egyptians, nor did he make peace with the sin of the Israelites. God is righteously violent toward all sin, which means that he is also righteously violent toward our sin. He will not make peace with our sin. Some blood must be shed. And this isn't a reflection of a violent, fly-off-the-handle, angry God. It is more a reflection of the demeaning, devastating, destructive nature of sin itself. Blood must be shed. Those, those idols that you keep hidden away in those secret compartments of your heart they require blood your grumbling and complaining at the people that God has put in your life it requires blood your anger at God because of his plan for your life it requires blood your addictions that seem to salve your soul for a whole 15 seconds before they drop you back in the pit of despair they require blood and your puffed up performance that is fueled by pride, it requires blood. For God to stand you, for God to look at you, for God to forgive you without burning you up in the fire of his holiness, it requires blood. You've only got one shot. You only have one plea, one hope, one chance before this almighty God, and there must be blood. The only question is whose will it be? 
Whose will it be? You know that your blood won't suffice. You know that your attempts don't work out. You need a lamb. You need a lamb, one who is perfect, without spot, without blemish. And hear me tonight. His name, you know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. His name is Jesus, with pure and perfect blood, born of a virgin, with not a drop of sin in him. You need a lamb, one who lived sinless, fully obedient to the end, without bickering or complaining or grumbling. His name is Jesus, tried, tested, and found faithful and true. You need a lamb, one who never lied, never cheated, never two-faced anybody, and proved himself completely trustworthy. And his name is Jesus. There was no deceit ever found in his mouth. You need a lamb, one who can take away your sins, cleanse your conscience, and set you free from your silly religion that you think protects you. His name is Jesus, and his blood is enough for you. His blood is enough for you tonight. Whenever Jesus walked onto the scene of history, into our view, his cousin, John the Baptist, the most famous man in the land at the time, he looked at him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then three years later, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey at the same time that dozens of shepherds are herding in their sheep so that they can sell them to all the Jewish families who are buying lambs. A few days later, Jesus is breaking bread and drinking wine with his disciples while families all throughout the land are doing exactly what God told them to do, playing with their little lambs, preparing their little lambs, getting ready to sacrifice their little lambs. Then the next day, that fateful day, God himself, through Jesus Christ, is sacrificed. And in the city of Jerusalem, it's bustling, it is busy, it is crowded and loud and blood is flowing because thousands of little lambs are being slaughtered, tons of little eyes are crying at the loss of the lamb, and parents are telling the story once again in grand fashion. All the while, right outside the city is the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. And then it went dark. It went silent. He died. And there was blood. There must be blood. Now, I want to close with, with two simple applications for us tonight. Two simple observations. And the first one is this. Do not make peace with your sin. Do not try to make peace with your sin. God won't. Some of you tonight, you want to make peace with your sin. You want to snuggle up close to it. You want, you're just going to let it slither right up to you like a snake and you're going to have a nice little dialogue with it. I, I understand, right? After all, you think it's a little idol and you keep it clean. You keep it hidden in your back pocket or your purse pocket. I understand that. How, how many times I have thought, oh, it's no big deal to be rude to my wife, to be disconnected, to be upset and uh, uh, pushed away from my family. Sin excused. Sin tolerated and idolatry deepened in my soul. And all the while, God would say to me, I refuse to make peace with your sin. Oh, but God, it's really not that big of a deal. There's really not very many casualties. Nobody's really getting hurt here, God. And he says, I refuse to make peace with your sin. It cost the blood of my son. It cost the death of my son. Don't make light of your sin. Don't make light of my son. 
What I'm doing when I try to excuse or tolerate the sin in my heart and the sin in my life, it's like I'm the dad huddled in the back of my little slave quarters, and I've got my idols, I've got my sin, and I've got them stuffed down into my jacket. I've got them all wrapped up in a pouch, and all I can think about is, oh, maybe he won't see my idols. Maybe he won't do anything about my idols. Maybe I won't get in trouble for my sin. I hope he doesn't see my sin. I I don't want to get rid of my sin, my sin, my sin. And the whole time, all that he's seen is the blood of the Lamb. It's the blood that atones for my sin, not my ability to hide it, not my ability to tolerate it or minimize it or excuse it. It's the blood of the Lamb that atones for my sin. There must be blood. So please, Religious people here tonight. Don't put your trust in your religion. Put your trust in his blood shed for you. You only have one thing to plead before Almighty God, and that's the blood of the Lamb. Second observation. Straight from Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. God shows his love for us when? While we were still sinners. At our worst, at our dirtiest, at our most rebellious, when we were pushing him away and running from him and we wanted nothing to do with him, God showed his love for us while we were still sinners, when we were huddled in our back corner and we refuse to let go of our bitterness. We refuse to try to loosen our grip of control on things. We refuse to give up our sin or our idols. We refuse to draw near to him. Yet even in that moment, he showed his love for us through the blood of his son. Not once we got our act together. Not once we figured everything out. Not once we finally tossed our idols in the trash for the last time. At our worst, God gave his best. At our worst, God gave his blood for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This, this is the soul-satisfying, idol-purging story of the Passover. You only have one thing to plead before Almighty God, and that's the blood of Jesus. And the only thing you need to plead before him is the blood of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, You're sovereign. You are in control. You are reigning and ruling. Pharaoh himself couldn't throw you off your throne. Pilate couldn't throw you off your throne. And we certainly can't throw you off your throne. You are king. And you've made it clear to us that our sin is serious. It is devastating. It is destroying. It's demeaning. And you refuse to make peace with our sin. So much so that you gave the perfect life of your son, Jesus Christ. His blood spilled and poured out. And so, Father, tonight I pray, oh God, please, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that the blood of Jesus would wash us white as snow. I pray for those in this room who are running from you, discarding you, turning away from you, 
that you would show them your love. You would prove to them your love through the blood of Jesus given for them before they ever turn to you. Christ died while we were still sinners. And Father, I pray for the religious, the rule keepers among us. I pray that we would not take our sin lightly, that we would not take your son lightly, but that we would be blown away by the fact that you passed over us. Jesus, we love you for your sacrifice. We praise you for your sacrifice. And we confess that we need your sacrifice.